So here's a nice little dynamics problem. Let's say we have this block, it's released from rest, slides down the ramp, goes around a little loop-de-loop, -loop, and then comes out the other side. And what's given to me? I'm giving you the radius of this loop in the track, I'm giving you the mass of the block, and I'll tell you that the block is released from rest. So what we want to do is we want to find the minimum height h, so that when we, re when we release the block at this height, the block uh, slides down and remains in contact with the track the entire way through. Now the wording of this problem is, sub is sug now the wording of this problem is suggestive, right? It suggests that there's some minimum height, so that if we're above that height, it makes it all the way through the through the loop, and if we're below that height, it does not remain in contact with the patch. Perhaps it comes through and and soups down and goes woo poop and shoots off. Right? That's what that's suggesting. Now it's kind of difficult to to analyze a path that's going through some sort of irregular shape. So instead of considering this case where the block does not stay in contact with the path, we are going to assume the other case. That is, we'll assume that the block always remains in contact with the path, and we'll find the minimum height for which this thing is true. That's going to be our approach for solving the problem. So the next thing I'm going to do is draw a free body diagram of the block. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram at one of these critical points up here where the block is just about ready to fall off the, off the track. So I'm going to pick a, one of these points somewhat arbitrarily. I'll pick it right about there. So at this particular point, weight is acting straight down, as it always does. I'll just label it W right there. And the normal force, we've got the, we got the track pushing on the block uh, sort of perpendicular to the track, right? So we've got a normal force acting that way. Now for coordinates, I'm going to choose path coordinates, which means I'm going to choose coordinates that way and that way. So this way would be the direction tangent to the path. I'm going to call that E hat T. And the direction perpendicular to the path, I'm going to call, I'm going to call E hat N. And when I, draw, when I define perpendicular to the path, I'm going to draw that sort of in the direction that points towards the center of curvature. So upon that definition, my normal force is just n in the e hat n direction. And my weights, I can put this in the e hat t in the e hat n directions as well. And I can do it if I define the, some sort of angle here. So there's the direction that's sort of in the e hat t direction. I'll take that direction and denote theta by the angle of the e hat t direction relative to horizontal as I've drawn it. So when you work out the components, the weight is uh, mg it would be a sine theta, or actually minus sine theta, in the e hat t direction, and a plus mg cosine theta in the e hat n direction. So my next order of business is, is to draw a mass acceleration diagram. And again, we'll draw the block sort of cocked over to the side here, be because it's connected to or in contact with the sloped part of the track. As we've seen in the past, we have a component of acceleration tangent to the track, right? piece in the e hat t direction. But we, since this path is curved, we also have a component of the acceleration perpendicular to the path. So let me draw that one here as well. Mass acceleration now has both components in there because we're accelerating or we're moving along a path that's, that's curved. Where the normal or perpendicular component of acceleration is the usual centripetal piece. It's v squared, speed squared divided by radius of curvature. So now we're going to scroll down and, and start doing some Newton's second law analysis in the e hat t direction, minus mg sine theta. So one component of my weight, and that has to equal mass times that tangential component of acceleration. And then in the e hat n direction, what do I have? I've got normal force pushing. I've got weight pushing. Maybe the weight's pulling. But regardless, this has to equal mass times the normal component of acceleration. Or I actually had an expression for this, didn't I? I said mass times uh, speed squared at this instant divided by the radius. So let me look at the second equation first. It says, by rearrange terms, it says that the normal force is equal to mass times speed squared divided by radius minus uh, mass or weight component cosine theta. So let's take a step back here and see what's going on, make sure we understand it. So recall we're looking at our block, we're assuming that the block is in contact with the track. So if that's the case, then the track is pushing on the block, right? And that's that normal force we see there. 
It's the track pushing on the block. It's keeping the block from flying through the track. Now that normal force has to be in the positive E head end direction, right? If we're in contact with the track. Because if it's in the opposite direction, that, mean, that would mean the track would be pulling on the block. The track cannot pull on the block. It can only push on the block. So this, this N here has to be positive. Now let's go down to our actual equations. Now for our assumption to hold, that is for the block to remain in contact with the track, I need the normal force to be positive. I need the track to be pushing down. So let's look at the, the terms in my normal. First I got a mass times speed squared over R. That's a positive number, right? Mass is positive, speed is positive, speed squared is positive, R is positive. So the, here's a positive contribution to my normal force. The other one's a negative contribution if I'm on this part of the wall where the block is more or less upside down, right? So if theta is between positive 90 and minus 90, this weight term is creating a negative effect on that normal force. And furthermore, note that this, this positive piece, call that the positive piece, call this the negative piece, the positive piece is smallest. In other words, it's most critical. This positive piece is most critical when the speed is smallest, right? Where is the speed smallest? The speed is smallest at the very top, right? At the highest point. Whenever we're going uphill, we're, we're losing our, our kinetic energy. Getting us. So this one's critical at the top. This one is also critical at the top, right? When cosine theta is one, then, the, then this weight term has its biggest effect. Again, when theta equals zero, what does that mean? Where did my picture go again? When theta equals zero, I'm at the top once again. So the top of this, of this path, the top of my track here, is the most critical point for n if we want to be able to stay on the track. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say at the top, my normal force is equal to m speed, maybe we'll say speed top squared over radius minus the entire weight. This is what we get when theta equals zero. So this is going to be an important quantity for this. This is going to give us that, that condition in which uh, the block is just about to fly off the track. So again, we want to choose the height of our, of our initial drop so that uh, this normal force is just barely positive. So it appears that in order to calculate this normal force, I'm going to need the speed at the very top of the path, right? And if you think about that, this is a work energy problem from here out because we're interested in the relationship between this height and the speed of the block when it's at the top of the path. Notice all the forces acting on this particle. I got the weight, that's a conservative force. I got the normal force, that's perpendicular to the path, hence normal. It's not producing any work. So my only force doing work is that of the weight. And weight is one of those easy problems, or easy forces for which to calculate work. So let's do it. So in, the, in formulating the work energy principle, we need to uh, define a work and going from some point A to some point B, so let's define those right now. We'll let A be the point at which we release the block and we'll let B be the point where we're at the very top because that's what we care about. So I think we can just start diving in. Notice the kinetic energy at point A is going to be zero, right, because we're released from rest. Uh, TB, that's, that's one half mass times speed at the top squared, right? There's B at the top squared. And this, this has to equal the work done by the weight. Again, the work done by weight is mg times the change in elevation. So we start off at an elevation of h above 0. I'll call that 0. And we end up at a height. When we're at point b, we're ended up, we end up at a height uh, 2 times the radius. So when we get down here, this work is m times g. What did I say? h minus twice the radius. So there's the, the distance dropped, or the elevation drop. And what does this give us? We wanted a speed squared, right, to put in there. So speed squared, speed at the top squared, I'm getting, notice the masses cancel out, uh, 2 times g times h minus 2 r's. And I don't want to solve for vt. I'll just keep it in terms of vt squared, because that's exactly the term that appears to my normal force. So all right, so normal force is equal to I got 2 times the weight change in, in elevation divided by radius minus the weight. So again, what I'm after is I, so again, what, what are we after? We're, we're interested in finding the minimum height for which the block remains in contact. In other words, we're, we want to find the minimum h here so that n, my normal force, still remains positive. The critical case, of course, is, when, is the h for which 
this normal force is exactly zero. So let's go ahead and work with that. So this tells us that 2mg h minus 2r might is equal to mg. I forgot to divide by r here. So notice that the mg's both go away. So that leaves me with 2 h minus 2r is equal to r. So if I work on solving for h, I get 2h is equal to, I got four r's over here, plus another r, so I'm getting five r's. Or h is equal to five halves of an r. And there's my answer. Now, although this one's kind of trivial, I want you to get in the habit of doing a unit check every time. So let's do it. Units tell me on the left-hand side I have a length. On the right-hand side I have five, hands, five halves of another length. So the units do check out. And I think I'm happy with the results. Here's the height at which you need to start in order for it to go completely around the loop. And the height is in terms of the radius of the curve. Now if you go onto YouTube, you can find some videos by groups of people who build escape ramps. And one of these ramps they build is a so-called loop of death. And you can see them having some difficulty, or these skaters having some difficulty, staying on the loop, staying in contact with the ramp uh, throughout the top of the ramp. And if you stop this video, in fact we'll do it right here, as the skater is going through a bone crushing crash, look at the height of that ramp. Remember our analysis says that ramp must start at least one radius above the top of the loop in order to remain contact with the track at all times. It doesn't look like that's happening here. And you can look at the starting points on all these other ramps and it looks pretty much the same. They're starting way too low in order to remain contact uh, with the track at all times and the consequences are quite evident. And it looks as though these people who build ramps should perhaps take a dynamics course. Ouch. <laughs> Ugh. Now here's a guy who finally makes it around. My guess is that he lost contact with the ramp up there and just somehow maintained control. 